Emily. Um, so, in the, from my side, this tonight, I wanted to discuss the things that you should actually do before reaching out to the press, meaning defining what is your startup vision and what are the messages that you want it to uh, convey. So, um, yeah, before uh, we kick off, who am I? I work at The Family. So basically my job is about um, helping founders whenever they need to communicate um, because they have a specific milestone or because they have to reach specific goals. And before that, I was working at Dropbox. Um, do you know Dropbox? Cool. I uh, was working at Dropbox for three years, and it's basically the. It was a little bit of the um, reverse. Like um, it was about localizing the vision of an American tech company for the European markets. Um, it was interesting. And before that, I worked in um, different agencies um, where I worked for tech companies like Facebook or um, other startups. So. Um, Something that I wanted to say um, and make clear before we talk about the vision is um, that there's never been a better time in history in Europe to be vocal about your startup. And sometimes the founders tend to forget about that, but just remember that only four to six years ago, you wouldn't have literally the space in the newspaper or the media to talk about your startup. And you know that each regional tech hubs, so the US or EMEA or, the, or China, they shape their own uh, tech media landscape. And because of the structuration of the um, European market lately in, this, in these past years, it shaped just um, the, the tech media landscape in Europe. So it's, yeah, there's never been a better time to be vocal about your startup. And the journalists in these media, obviously they are journalists, so they want to uh, relay stories that are based on facts and data, but they also, they will be more likely to relay your story if you uh, are able to convey a vision that they understand, and that's how they will be more interested in your business afterwards. So, when we say, when we talk about a vision, um, what it is exactly, because I know that the term can seem a little bit uh, almost arrogant sometimes. Um, what is a vision? I mean, I already have to run a business, I have to focus on my product, and on top of that, I need to think about vision. Um, actually, there is a few uh, objectives, there is a few goals that you uh, want to have in mind when, uh, for which it's, it's important to have a vision. And these goals, um, I listed four main ones. The first one is when you are evolving in a very crowded market, in a very competitive market. The second one would be whenever you um, need to close a very important deal, for example. The third one is the recruitment. And that's actually really interesting. Uh, I found out that the number one issue for funders is actually the recruitment. And then the first one would be whenever you uh, want to uh, hit specific financial, financial milestones in the next months or years. Um, so, like the fundraising or stuff like that. I could add a fifth one that would be the customer acquisition. The thing is, um, I most of the time I don't recommend the funders to do PR or communicate on their vision just with the um, with end goal of customer acquisition because that doesn't work. If your only struggle is to uh, get more customers, then do marketing activities, do other stuff, but don't focus on PR. That won't help you on, on the long run on that front. Um, so um, I, I don't know if you were able to write, uh, read the um, press headlines that I put. Are you able to read them? Uh, it's just a few examples of um, visions that some companies relay in the press and the vision that they that they convey. So I put uh, I took different examples from um, different companies uh, in different industries. So Patagonia, you, do you know Patagonia? So they sell um, organic clothes, but what they really tell the world is literally we're going to save the planet. Uh, and if you uh, if I read the headlines, it's about 
um, exclusive Patagonia is in business to save our home planet, stuff like that. Um, IKEA, IKEA, they sell uh, furniture for households, but what they tell the world is how they enlighten the day-to-day -day life of, of the mini. Same with tech companies like Dropbox and Tesla. They have amazing products built by the best engineers, um, but they are telling a much more high-level story. So now you might think, okay, that's great, but I'm not working in these companies. They are already super big. How I can get started as a founder of an early-stage startup? Um, Actually, there is a, a kind of framework that we like to give our founders, and we like to remind them that they have to focus on a few things. So the first one is we ask them to ask uh, themselves what is their history and experience, um, where comes from the passion for what they're doing, what uh, inspired them to form their business, very important, what is the broader, uh, bigger social issue that they're tackling, um, and then why what they're doing is different. And then it comes, uh, it all goes down to also their team and why they hired the specific people in their team. So now, even more concretely, there is a very simple exercise that you might want to do as a founder. It's just to write down on paper um, the answers of these questions. So who we are, um, in a v it has to be very short and simple in just 100 words. Um, what we do, it's more related to the core of the business, her role in society, her team style, how we operate, and then how we got here. So it's super simple, but actually when you ask founder or co some co-founders to just do this work, suddenly they have to choose between a world and the other. They have to um, have a discussion about, okay, should we say that? Should we be vocal about that or not? So it just basically forces the conversation. Um, and because also you uh, have to be very short and concise, it uh, helps you to not you know, use jargon and stuff like that. So when you're doing it, it's, um, so as I say, write down the key messages. Um, you have to stay true to yourself. Don't think about the your message is just like something that can help you to get media coverage, let's say. That's not important, that's not what you're trying to do. Think about what would be your own ideal headline, just like the ones that um, I was showing earlier for the other companies. If you think about the ideal headline for your startup, what, what would it be? And then um, step into your customer's shoes because sometimes it really helps to get another perspective. And um, in terms of things to not do, as I said, don't use jargon. When you work in a startup, you tend to just use words that are very natural to you, and that means something. Um, spoiler, most of the time it doesn't mean anything to the broader world. And then um, don't create fake story, don't make up figures, obviously. Don't think only with the media in mind, as I say. And then also it's more of a broader tip, but don't um, disperse yourself just because you've decided that now you want to do PR or stuff like that. Actually, just obviously focus still on your product. As a founder, that's the most important thing. Um, and then, so when you're there, basically you're going to think, okay, now do um, I am more clear about the messages that I want to convey, so maybe I want to do, I want to send um, press speeches, I want to write some opens or I don't know. The thing is to relay, to convey a vision, you don't only have to focus on the press and because it's all of a virtual circle, you want to relay um, some pieces of content that, that gonna talk to um, the different audiences that will ultimately nurture how the media will perceive you. So I'm gonna show you a few examples of pieces of content that you can create. So the first goal is um, when you need to relay a vision because you want to bring your team together and just federate them around uh, the same vision, the very simple thing to do is a manifesto, write down a manifesto, and actually you can see the family, m yeah. yeah, it's over there. You can see the family manifesto just behind the, the wall. It's um, super short, same, super concise. It really respects the tone of your startup. 
And you can decide whether you want to publish, uh, write it for yourself, whether you want to um, put it in your, in your office so that the employees can see it whenever they uh, come to work every morning or whenever um, sometimes comes to, to your office and external people and then they can see right away what is your startup about. Then um, a second reason why you'd like to be um, vocal about your vision is when you need to educate the public about the bigger social issue that you want to tackle. And um, I wanted to show you two examples. I'm sure most of you are familiar with this one. It's um, the secret um, Tesla master plan that Elon Musk published in 2006. Um, he published it on the blog and it's just, it's really a blog post that he put on a Tesla blog, obviously. And it's really, it's his plan to conquer the, con yeah, conquer the world for in the next decades. And it's how, um, how he's rethinking the whole, um, you know, um, sustainable energy model for the world, what he's trying to achieve with Tesla. Um, and it's actually very funny if you read it. It's written at the first person. There is absolutely no, um, you know, corporate bullshit that you can find on lots of corporate sites, websites, or blogs. Um, so why not write in your own master plan? What if you had to write it down? What would be the master plan for your startup? That's also a really good exercise. And then you can decide whether you want to keep it to yourself or maybe you want to share it with your team, maybe you want to publish it also on your blog. Another example of um, a piece of content that is interesting to create whenever you need to educate your audience about your vision before selling them your product is Fempo. So Fempo, they sell um, organic menstrual panties. And the thing is that they have to convince women that no, they can just um, embrace this period of the month in another way than the whole hygiene industry has been telling them for, I don't know, the last 20 years. So instead of um, informing about their product and um, all yeah, the details about the, the composition and everything, they host conferences where they don't talk at all about FEMPO and what they're doing, but instead they uh, make public events where they invite on stage um, sociology researchers about the gender, um, doctors specialized in hormonal cycles. And they just create a conversation. So obviously not only they create a community, but also at the end of the day, because the audiences get what the vision behind, then suddenly after the conferences, they're like, oh, can I have a look at your product? That's actually um, interesting, blah, blah, blah. So that's um, something really clever that they were able to, to put together. Um, yeah, another reason why you want to be vocal is when you need to position your startup as a leader in a very crowded industry. And the example that I like is um, the publishing uh, example. So I've put a few um, yeah, companies, Stripe, so I guess you all know Stripe. You, most of you must uh, know that they have their own um, book publishing. Um, the family, so we publish different type of books and um, Screen, Screen is a security management platform. This example is actually interesting and funny. They decided that um, they wanted to tell the story in another way. And in to do so, they created a hero called BotBot. Bot. And BotBot Bot is literally the hero of um, children's stories. So they created children's stories and they um, published, they sent it out to um, different type of um, clients, prospects, um, the media obviously. And is BotBot Bot is exploring the, the struggle and the issue raised by the technology and the world of the internet. And it's actually super funny and they were able to prove that they were able to talk about the security issues without sounding boring or very, you know, having a very complex approach. And um, the family, so we are a CEO, Alice. She wanted to tell the story of the family and the vision behind the family. So instead of writing a book, she felt that it wasn't really true to herself. She didn't feel like it was something she would do. She is actually very creative and she likes to draw. 
So she decided to literally draw the, the story of the family in a comic book. So Sam, we send then the comics book um, to our ecosystem, to the different founders of the family, to um, yeah, even journalists and everyone, and it worked very, very well. Um, you want to be vocal about your vision, also when you need to gather some supports from the external world. Whenever, for example, you are entering a market in which you need to advocate for a new legal framework, let's say. Um, and an example that I like is um, Comet. I don't know if you guys know Comet. It's a startup that um, has a technology which matches um, tech freelancers, developers, with large corporations that are in demand for skilled developers. Um, but they can't really, and they don't want to tell that, it's not actually super interesting, but they have to tell their vision of um, what, is, what should be the new job market, the rise of the freelancers. And to do so, they um, developed a campaign that they called the post-freelancing campaign. And they wrote down the manifesto, but it wasn't a manifesto that they kept to themselves. They sent out the manifesto to all of the co freelancing community in France and they requested people to sign the manifesto if the people were um, in line, aligned with their vision. So with that, they were able to get um, thousand, maybe I don't have the last figure, but like 10,000 of signatures from freelancers that were not necessarily part of their Comet community. They recorded a video out of it, and it was really just about the vision. And then the last um, example that I wanted to tell is when you need to um, be vocal about your vision to actually reach out to your investors, future investors, or uh, possibly shareholders. For example, when at some point you know that you want to raise funds. And um, I just want to, I'm sure most of you know this example, the annual letter um, to shareholders from Jeff Bezos. Um, if you never read this letter, you should really do it because that's an annual letter that Jeff Bezos writes every single year since 1997 to his shareholders and it's public. And um, the tone is actually absolutely not corporate. It's not the type of tone that you would expect from a CEO to um, when he talks to his shareholders. It's actually funny, uh, a little bit like the same like Musk with the master plan. He writes at the first person. He has lots of ane personal anecdotes. And the same message when you read all the letter each year, each year, each year, it's just that um, he tells to his shareholders, hey guys, it's all about the long term. Hanging there, we'll get there. This is our vision. This is a gentle reminder of what mm, the, the vision is for Amazon. And this is why you invested at the first place. Um, so yeah, it's actually unusual. And it's always a good inspiration whenever you want to remind to some people that you have um, also a vision for your startup. Um, so yeah, that was uh, the things I wanted to talk to you tonight. Um, so to sum up, when, whenever you want to be vocal about your startup, think first about what are your goals. If maybe you want to recruit, maybe you want to sign deals, maybe just think about that. Take a step back before going out for the media, for the media as if it was the end goal. That is not. And then when you think about your vision, don't also think about only the press speeches because there are many, many other ways to convey your vision to different audiences that will ultimately nurture the whole thing. Thank you for listening to me. Okay, just a heads up, we're going to do Q&A afterwards with all three speakers so you can ask uh, them all all questions that you have in mind so try to remember them so now without further ado I want to welcome the second speaker on stage she is a journalist based in London she works for Sifted which is a media backed by the Financial Times and she reports on startups and tech and uh, yeah please help me welcome Amy on stage
Hello. Uh, so I'm Amy. I work for Sifted. How many people here have heard of Sifted? Oh, not that many. Okay, so Sifted, we're really new. We launched our website three months ago. We write about uh, European startup and tech. Um, we're based in London, but we have, uh, we're building a team out around Europe. And I want to today talk about some common misconceptions that I get from uh, startup people and founders about what they think journalists find interesting and what I do not find interesting. Um, so what makes for an interesting story? It is definitely not what most founders think. Um, the first thing, people think that funding rounds are really, really exciting, and they're not. They're like the most boring type of news possible. Like, you know, it's, uh, I always, when people uh, kind of ask me like what, what makes for an interesting story, I'm like, think about how you would tell a story to your friend. Like if you're in the pub, I'm English, so if you're in the pub, like, how, how do you tell stories? Do you, say you've just, like, bought a house. Are you going to be like, hey, I bought a house for this much money, and I use this estate agent, and it's in this location? Because that's, like, effectively what you're doing when you tell me about your funding round, and you're like, I raised this much money, it was this VC. Like, that is dull. What I really want to hear about is all the stuff that led up to that. So in the buying a house anecdote, you know, like, how many estate agents screwed you over? How many properties fell through? What did you learn from that? What advice would you have for other people so for a funding round for me what I want to hear about is the journey you've been on to get there or the journey that you're going to go on with that money afterwards so that is just that is not a focus for me it's all about um, the learnings the personal kind of journey that you've been through uh, definitely not like the actual money itself second one everyone wants to hear about how well you're doing they don't Everyone wants to hear about how you're fucking up just as much as they are. Uh, the amount of press releases I get where someone's like, here's this amazing CEO who's already run three companies, even though they're only five years old, and they've uh, raised like 200 million pounds from these super impressive investors. I'm like, I don't want to write about you. You sound like a twat. So uh, <laughs> what um, people, when I ask people, what do you want to hear more about? So many people say they want to hear about failure. And that's not because everyone wants everyone else to be having a horrible time. That's because people want to feel that they can empathize with someone. Um, and I think if you have people on stage who just basically brag, again, like think of think if you're in the pub with your friend, like they have to be a really good friend to, to put up with you just sitting there being like, I'm having a great time. I'm just like winning at life. What they really want to hear about is the kind of funny stories about, you know, where you're cooking up, like this, the self-deprecating stuff, because that's, well, it's, it's an interesting story, but it also contains a lot of learnings. Um, I think um, in terms of pitching stories, like more touched on this, but um, an angle to look at is always just what are you learning? What have you found out recently? You expanded to a new market. You know, what did you learn about doing that process? You um, had to fire some members of staff for the first time. Like, why was that? How did you manage that? How did that feel personally? How did you go through that? You know, what what advice would you have for other founders? That's all really interesting, useful, practical insights. And because fundamentally there are people at the heart of those stories, they're also interesting because people are generally interesting. Um, all company milestones are public news. They're not. I, do, I really don't care if your company is now three years old and you're having a birthday party. Like, that's, that's really not interesting. Um, I probably also don't care if you've just hired five members of staff. I might care if you've just hired 100 members of staff and your company was only 50 people big two weeks ago. Like, that would be interesting because that must be hard. You know, if you've grown that fast, how have you managed that? You know, how have you, how do you make sure that like everyone knows where the toilet is and, and like, you know, teams still function? Like the kind of, you know, wh when you've got questions, when you, you kind of found something really intriguing and exciting, I probably will too. But like the fact that you've just managed to survive another year is in, in and of itself not, not super exciting. So figuring out, um, it's often a case that, and I totally understand this, that when you work for a company, whether you're a founder or just an employee, you put so much time and love and effort into what you're working on that it seems like the most exciting thing in the world. 
take a step back before you share that with a journalist and be like, if I told my grandma this, would she find that interesting? And if she wouldn't, then probably like the broader public would not find that interesting either. Um, your founding story never gets stale. It does. It gets stale really, really quickly. So my, uh, my process before I interview people, I obviously look at Google News and I read a whole bunch of other interviews that people have already done. And inevitably, if your company is, you know, has been going for a little while, you would have told your founding story over and over again. And there are founders who are very good at reeling out the same anecdotes in exactly the same way with exactly the same phrasing. And if you give me that, and I've already read like five interviews where you've said the same thing, uh, that's not very exciting for me. Journalists are fundamentally quite vain and we really like feeling like we've got something new. So give me something new. Don't give me the old stuff. You always need to be, to be fresh, to be interesting, to be sharing something different. And if you're, if you're you know, a startup, you're learning stuff all the time. Stuff is changing all the time. You're probably pivoting. You're probably getting new members of staff. You're probably trying out new products. You're probably going to new markets. You're probably discovering that some investors are terrible people and other ones are really nice. So there's always going to be something new you could talk to a journalist about. You might not always want to talk to them about some of that stuff, though. Number five, if in doubt, ask a PR person. They'll know. With the exception of a few excellent PR people like Maud, and I'm not just saying that because she's sitting there, she actually is very good at her job. Um, there are a lot of people in PR who work with startups who should not be working with startups. Startups work very differently and have very different kind of stories than big businesses, and generally quite traditional PR firms, quite big PR firms, in my experience, they don't know how to work with startups. And it's really, unlikely that it's going to be worth your time and your money to work with them. So advice I would always give to, to people at startups is um, speak to other founders who've worked with a PR company, figure out like what coverage they actually got them, like what did they actually help them achieve, like speak to people like that. Just, you know, like signing a deal with a PR company is not magically going to make you, you know, hit all the national newspapers. I probably get about at least 20 emails a day from just random PR people. And I probably don't open most of them because I don't have a personal relationship with that person. They probably sent that email to a whole bunch of other journalists, cycling back to that thing about how I always want to be writing about something that other people aren't writing about. That's not really how I roll. I'd much rather build like the, the best communications people that I know are often people who've worked at a startup for quite a long time. They really love that company. They really know it well. They're really interested in startups. They're interested in other startups. And then they can figure out like, oh, if I'm interested in finding out you know, what's going on behind the scenes there, and actually we're doing something similarly interesting with our kind of hiring uh, process or with the way we're selecting our investors or the free lunches we've suddenly started offering, then you, you've got a much better sense of what people would find interesting about your company than some random PR agency that kind of functions very differently and doesn't live in the same ecosystem that, that you do. Um, so I personally, and, and all journalists are different, that is a big caveat, all journalists are very different, but me, um, I'd much rather work with founders, get emails from people who work at companies because they're much closer to the actions, they're much better at telling me like the real story. Um, I've kept it short and sweet because often I find when I talk about um, PR and storytelling, I can just end up ranting about all of the ways I don't like the way PR agencies work, um, and it's often much more productive for people just to ask me questions afterwards. So, um, thank you. I've been Amy. Um, this is Sifted. Please sign up to us. Please give me critical feedback about what we're writing about, um, and follow me on Twitter and social media and all that stuff. Thanks. Wonderful. Okay, and now last but not least, we have uh, 
Julia here. She was uh, head of PR at Joblift. Uh, some of you might know it. It's a very cool startup here in Berlin. Uh, and she will give a, diff a bit of a different angle around how to use data to create actual uh, really cool content. So please give a warm applause for Julia. Here you go. Thanks. Okay. Yeah, so thanks a lot for this opportunity to speak today. Um, so my topic is a bit different, as um, you already said. It's about data-driven PR or data storytelling. Uh, just to quickly explain you why I came up with this topic. Um, so I started working at Joblift around three years ago. And when I started there, there was nothing. It was an early stage startup. There was no PR. And my task was kind of to build or to increase visibility and reach, not necessarily to increase brand awareness. So. It was our aim to kind of increase um, the number of publications that we get in the press, and data turned out to be a good way to um, <coughs> yeah, increase those numbers or to get the visibility we wanted to get um, with journalists. Um, and to start my talk, I would like to introduce with a quote that says, without data, you're just another person with an opinion. And I think that's a, a quite, quite a nice summary of what data storytelling um, is about. It gives you the credibility because you kind of appear objective to the press. You have numbers, you're fact-based. And this is what you want to reach when you interact with the press. You want to be perceived as credible. And um, yeah, having said that, um, data does not only help you to be published on a regular basis to increase your SEO value, it also helps you to um, become a thought leader ultimately if you're really, really credible and you build the trust with journalists over a long time. And I thought about it from a journalist perspective. So of course I'm not a journalist, please Amy correct me if I'm wrong, but um, that is just based on my personal experience, my assumptions throughout the years. Um, so, from my experience, journalists are looking for great stories, not obvious marketing. So this is just what you said um, before. It's not about telling about your funding round, about how great your startup is or your latest feature release. Nobody's going to be interested in that. So it's really about stories and, and data can actually provide you with these stories because yeah, if you do not have, you have your vision, but you can also talk about your vision with numbers, for instance, you can prove it with numbers. And it's a good way to get started and not only create stories, but also unique angles. Because if you have internal data, if you have proprietary data no one else has access to, then you have a story to tell that no one else can reproduce. And this is really, you don't want to retell the news that is already out there. You really want to create something unique. Journalists are also looking for topical hooks. So what that, does that mean? Um, so if you create an interesting relationship between your topic and a current trend or current news. Then you create a topic, a hook, and data can give you this opportunity because let's say there is some bus around a certain topic and, and you have data that can actually prove or, or confirm this, this trend, then you can add something to this discussion without retelling the story. Journalists are also looking for genuine expertise, credibility, and thought leadership. This is what I already mentioned before. And of course, you do not have credibility right from the beginning, or you do not have thought leadership from it right from the beginning. It's, it's a lot of work. It's a lot of effort over the years. But you have to be consistent. And if you send out data-driven stories um, on a regular basis, you end up being credible. Or you can, but if you do it right, of course, you can build the trust that you really want to achieve. So for instance, for us in the beginning, it wasn't always there. So we started sending out first press releases, and it was first picked up by smaller magazines, blogs, and so on. At some point, we were picked up by bigger media, very big newspapers like the Financial Times in Germany, Süddeutsche Zeitung, and so on. And then um, people started to know us, and we, we kept on building our relationships with, new, with journalists. And at some point, they reached out to us to get the data they wanted or to get the information they wanted. So some weeks ago, for instance, it was very nice to see. There was, um, I think, the biggest Dutch radio station reached out to Joblift, and they wanted to have data on um, vacation days, which is stated on, on job ads. And as we have access to these job ads, and they knew 
that we would have this data, they, they asked us. And, and in the broadcast, they said that they actually reached out to us and we didn't send the information to them. So that was really nice to see that eventually we got this credibility or this trust that journalists reach out to us. So now you might say, okay, that's nice, that's interesting, but where do I actually get the data from? Or where can I find this data? So let me mention two things first. First of all, it's very, very important that you use a credible data source. Because, yeah, data storytelling can build trust, but only if it's based on solid data. So this is really important. Everyone knows the data can be easily manipulated and misinterpreted, so it's really, really important that you have a credible data source. If you do not have a credible data source, then it can, then it can even harm your PR, so you should not do it. Second of all, always try to use internal data, because internal data create the most original stories. This is data you only have access to, so no one else can tell the same story. So this is really, yeah, a good way to, to create a unique story. So what kind of internal data could you find? Um, employee data. So talking about vision, you could also do employee question interviews, surveys, and, and find out how they like put this vision into practice, for instance. You could use customer data, you could look into your CRM, you could analyze interviews that you have done with your partners. You could use user data, it just, I don't know, depends on your business model, of course, but you could check app subscriptions, you could, you could check Google Analytics and, and see how, yeah, check the, uh, anal analyze the um, um, behavior, the demographics on Google Analytics. But just be aware of the fact that if your company is also doing SEM, then um, your data might be biased. Because if, for instance, you're only targeting female um, people in Berlin, then their behavior is not representative of the overall population, of course. And also keep in mind that there are data regulations, so you always need to get everyone's consent before um, publishing the data or communicating the data. But if you use aggregated data, you can, you're fine. It's, it's okay. If you really do not want to use or you really do not have these internal sources, which I don't think is true because everyone has internal data somewhere, you could create surveys, for instance. There are tools that allow you to easily integrate surveys on your website, like Typeform, for instance. Or you could also just do public surveys with Google or SurveyMonkey and, um, and there you can even buy responses. You should target around a thousand responses in order to be representative there. Having said that, external data can also be very interesting, especially if you want to complement your story. So let's say you found that nice story some time ago, which is really interesting, or this nice external study, and you know that you have data to confirm this external study or to disconfirm the results. Then it can be very good, it can be a very good approach to, to kind of be provocative maybe, or to create an interesting, interesting news. So, you have different external data sources as well. You could look on social media, analyze Instagram, for instance, Twitter, hashtags, what is trending, what do people talk a lot, a lot about, Google Trends. This is a good tool, everyone knows it probably. It's a good tool to analyze search volume over time for specific keywords. I know that journalists often do not like Google Trends so much, so you could also just say, um, that you've analyzed uh, the evolution of uh, search volume for a specific keyword on Google without explicitly mentioning Google Trends. You could use government data. So most of the countries have national statistics publicly available, which is really good. Uh, studies from research firms, uh, look into your industry organizations, um, and also academic studies. Uh, of course, you can also um, use different data sources for different content pieces, but you should always be consistent within your, or with your feed of expertise, because you ultimately want to achieve thought leadership or become an expert in your field. So now that you have found your perfect data source, how would you process the data? So this would be the next step. And I don't really want to go too much into detail on how to create a good content piece. There are a lot of like articles online. You can just, there, I think there are a lot of like, um, yeah, ways to find out about that. But I just collected or gathered my main seven learnings um, from the last three years. Um, and I think, yeah, they reflect how you can do data storytelling 
effectively, better maybe. First of all, consider your audience. So as always, you should always think about your target group, and in this case, it's the press, and journalists do not have a lot of time, so they scan your content piece, and if you have a lot of numbers in there, if it's very complicated, they will probably not read it. So make sure to keep it easy, to keep it simple. So a good rule would be to make, to have someone outside your team or even within your team read it, and if they understood it correctly, they explain it correctly, then you know that you're on a good path. Second tip goes in the same direction. Don't overstuff with data. So maybe you have done the maths and you have the feeling that that was very complicated and it's a lot of things to tell and, and you want to put everything in your content story, but it's actually not a good idea. Because data can be very overwhelming, data can be very complex, so just try to keep the interesting information only. A good rule would be to, to only present 10% of your findings and to keep the other 90%. So, because also very often journalists reach out to you afterwards and they would like to have additional information or additional numbers, and then you have it. You, you can just provide them with the numbers that you still have. And just put the interesting results in your content story. Tip number three, don't let data scare you. So often when new um, people joined in the team, they said, well, I'm more of a copywriter, I'm a creative person, I'm, I, I do not feel very comfortable producing these analysis, these studies. Well, you don't have to be the most analytical person in the world. So first of all, there's probably someone in your team or in your organization who can help you in case it's really too complicated. But having said that, content marketers or PR people are probably most effective at bringing data stories to life and they are able to really create creative stories and to turn this cold data into really insightful content. So you have to be creative, you have to be a creative person in order to produce in interesting data stories because everyone can create or can just describe numbers but that's not the point. You should really create something new and innovative. Tip number four, ditch your story if it isn't there. So a common mistake is that people have this great topic idea and they feel like, okay, I want to write about it. But if the data is not there, then the story is not there. So don't try to make the data fit the narrative. Um, that doesn't work. The good thing is that often by just looking into the data, you come up with a new topic. That was what I personally really liked when I worked with data, is that you don't have to be super creative. You can just look into your data and do some analysis, and sometimes you see interesting results, and, and it gives you new content ideas. So this is really nice. On the other hand, data storytelling is also not a story about numbers. So you might have a lot of numbers about a specific topic, but it's not interesting. If you're only descriptive, if you're purely descriptive, it's not a good content story, it's not a good yeah, creative idea. So you really have to discover the data, to filter the data, and to interpret the data. And if there's no story, then don't do it because, yeah, just think about what could be catchy, what could be newsworthy, what could I put in headlines, what could get the awareness of journalists. And if it's not really provocative in a way, you should always be fact-based, of course, but if it's not surprising, new, insightful, then it's not worth doing it. So tip number six is a no-brainer, cite your sources appropriately, it's very important. Um, it has the additional um, advantage that often the external source that you're citing um, will get aware of you and then they will promote you, they will maybe mention you, they will publish your study, they will link back to you, which is really cool, especially if it's a big company. And this one is very important. Um, as I already said several times, data can be overwhelming, it's complex, it can be a lot of information. So use data visualization. It's really, really important. Visual content is key. So one of the first things I did when I started doing these content stories was to create infographics. And as I said, it was an early stage startup, so we did not, do, did not have any resources. And, but that's not really an excuse. You can find a lot of tools online, um, like Canva or Infogram easily, that help you to create infographics easily on your own. And um, most of them are free, but you can upgrade them, and then you can e customize more. You can add your corporate colors, you can add your logo, which is also a nice way because it boosts your branding as well. It gives you more of a corporate identity if it's published. 
And also I have to say that um, often only our, only our infographics or our visual content was published. Um, but it doesn't matter in the end. What you want to achieve is, is visibility and, and branding and, and, and yeah, publications. And if it's your visual content or if it's your text, it doesn't matter. Uh, bigger newspapers, bigger um, media outlets usually have their own graphic department and st they create their own statistics, but especially smaller ones, they really like it. And to finalize my talk, I would like to show you three examples um, because I think it could help you to better understand how data storytelling could look like in practice. So the first one is um, from one of our competitors, actually. Um, it's a London-based uh, meta search engine for jobs uh, called Atsuna. And they have access to job ads as well. And they analyze salaries in different uh, districts in London, the average salary. And they created this nice uh, tube map. So it's a very easy idea, but it's a nice visualization. The second one, um, I chose this one because it only uses external data. And as I said, I, I would prefer internal data because you want to position yourself first. But if you really do not want to use internal data, you do not have internal data that you can use, sometimes it makes sense to also use external data. So this company, for instance, is, a, I think, a US camping company. And they created um, an infographic on the world's most Instagram landmarks. So it's very easy. The only thing they did is looking at hashtags and checking like which landmarks are m yeah, most Instagrammed. Um, the last one is from a Berlin-based um, tech company called home to go It's a platform for vacation rentals, and they do a lot of data stories. They're very successful at doing it also. And um, I chose this example because I think it's a very nice idea. Um, it's a very creative idea. And it's yeah, um, one of the, 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 the few examples that I found that um, th they actually checked for external data and turned it into their own data, proprietary data. So what they did is they called different ski resorts throughout Europe and asked for the price of a Coke, and which would reflect the price of the overall region. And then they created this ranking of the Ski Coke Index. And so they actually produced data that no one, or a story that no one else could produce because they did the research, they called all those resorts and they get, got the data, but it's not there. So it was a very creative and powerful idea to actually get more data, additional data. Yeah, so that was my, um, my talk about data storytelling. Thanks a lot for your attention. And yeah, if you have any questions now or later, you can also find me on LinkedIn. Thanks. So what we can do is have you to join her and then you guys can ask a whole bunch of questions if you have any. I'll give you this. Thanks. <laughs> yeah. we, we can't see you guys, by the way. <laughs> Hello, hello. Um, so uh, I also just launched my startup two months ago and PR is uh, definitely on the highest priority and I have no idea. Uh, a good intuition though, I think it's also important and uh, I just picked up the one sentence you said that PR doesn't work on the long run for customer acquisition and I'm like, what? Um, so why I'm investing, I'm like, seat just launched an MVP, but PR is the way to go, I'm certain. Uh, can you maybe just uh, give a deep dive on, on that? Yeah, on, on the matter, on the customer acquisition part. Um, it's actually because most of the founders, when they think about PR or comms activities, their um, the goal that they have directly in mind is getting more customers. But think about it, um, as a customer, when you um, read a newspaper and you read about a super nice um, startup that is doing, I don't know, something, um, you don't necessarily rush to buy this product or to use the service. It's just, it keeps in your head and then the next time you see it, and then you see it again and again and suddenly you're like, okay, yeah, maybe I'll give it a try. But in the meantime, 
if the, the same startup is reaching out to you because they want to maybe hire you because of your skills, um, just because for one time you read about that startup in the newspaper, that will ring a bell and that will give the startup um, a better opportunity to, um, you know, to get you interested in, in the job. So that was my, um, my message. It's more that I want to prepare the founders and set expectations in terms of customer acquisition. And it's less of a don't do that, it, it will never work. It's not about that. It's just that, honestly, you may be very, very disappointed if you only go for you know, the customer acquisition part. Do you want to complete? Um. <laughs> Anyone else? Hi. Um, thank you for the interesting presentations. Uh, my question is, um, once you uh, issue your PR or to this journalist, generally, what's the best way to kind of manage the, um, the, message, the, the messaging and make sure that it actually conveys what you're trying to, um, trying to convey through the press release? So how you do that, do you wanna give in? Um, and why for us, um, the best way was personalization. So we really spend a lot of time in creating relationships with the press. So first of all, looking for the right journalists. Um, for us, press distribution tools never really worked out. We always did a lot of qualitative work. And then the outreach itself, um, also the, every message was highly personalized. So we really tried to come up with um, news stories the journalists already published and it might be of interest, we could like add something there and, and, and really try to, already in the, in the object of the email, try to come up with something um, personal. It's a lot of work, but it really pays off. For us, it was half the, 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 the or like the, the, the <laughs> half the amount of clippings we got was really through the, through the personalization process, I think. And Amy, correct me if I'm wrong, but I think the press release thing is not necessarily, necessarily the, um, con the way to go, you know, content nowadays. Um, I don't know how much press releases you actually read. Um, okay, zero? Like not a <laughs> Five percent. Okay, um, which is actually good news because writing press release is super boring. Um, it's, you, you waste a huge amount of time when you want to, you know, um, just do the perfect press release that really matches your messages. Um, so you can achieve that by just sending a nice and short email. Sometimes it's actually more valuable than thinking about your press release again and again and refining it so that finally it looks um, perfect. If I, part of the problem with press releases is if I, if I get an email from someone I've never spoken to before being like, hey, we're announcing this really exciting thing tomorrow, do you want to speak to the founder this afternoon? I'm like, I'm a busy person. I have other stuff in my calendar. I can't suddenly, I'm not a news news journalist. I'm not hunting all the time for something to like fill the pages of the newspaper for tomorrow. I work on stuff quite long term and trends. So I want to hear about your company like three months before you have the big thing that you really want to talk about. I want to have already met some of your team. Maybe you came to an event and you grabbed me afterwards. Uh, maybe you just emailed and gave me feedback on a piece you liked or you commented on something I posted on LinkedIn. Like, just It's just human relationships. If, if so, you've never met someone before and then suddenly they come up to you and they're like, I really want you to do this thing for me, you're going to be like, oh, you're, you're a weirdo. You're not, you know, that's, that's not how you interact with with human beings, like I want to understand it. I sometimes might have a different angle or a different story that I would want to kind of pick out of that. And often a journalist is going to be a better person to figure out what what angle of a story will have like a wide ranging impact. But you need to give them access to you earlier in advance, and then then you have a better chance of them writing something really interesting about your company. If I if I fall into the cycle of like, oh, I get a press release and I'm gonna write something up really quickly, inevitably it will be less interesting, it will be less wide ranging, it will be less in depth, like it won't sell your company as well. Um, that's how I work, other journalists are different, but that's partly why I have such an allergic reaction to press releases because I just, I like getting to know people, I like getting to know companies and that doesn't happen by like a random cold email. Anyone else? 
Hello, hi. Um, so I'm, I want to pick up on the point that uh, you presented the, from the family in the middle in the, about the, sorry, I can't Maud. remember your name. <laughs> sorry? Uh, yeah, Maud. Anyway. Maud, yeah. Uh, so th this is on the content where you're talking about how startups or companies are also are sort of like publishing houses slash media. I find that super interesting personally because, uh, I mean, if you think of the spectrum of the kind of content, usually the spectrum is from marketing to journalism, you know, uh, but then I think you can even pull that further more and there's like academia and I, and I, and I don't want to go that there, but I think some startups are actually doing something super interesting and if the, if the right questions were raised, what they're working on are probably connecting to broader social, political, or economic problems. And I think that's a very interesting space where you can connect thinkers with people who are actually doing something on the field. My question is more how much of this is actually, I don't know, how much of it is, is it happening? Is this a trend or is it something that, yeah, how, what's the future of this kind of content? Sure. Um, so it has, I guess, always been happening, but you can definitely see that in the last two to three years, um, they there are more and more, usually it was only tech companies who are doing that, such as Stripe. Stripe, what they're doing, they're, it's very smart because they don't even ask for Stripe employees or Stripe, I don't know, C-level to write a book. They actually just republish in at their own book publishing um, edition the books that were already published years ago, a decade ago, um, books from geopolitical analysts. Um, a former CIA guy also was published at Stripe Press. Anyway, um, so the ultimate goal is that it nurtures Stripe positioning. They are a payment company, but also they are providing all this very thoughtful thinking about um, the future of tech, the future of economy, etc. Um, but then you also have startups that um, want to create content that can be um, that you would put in your living room. And that's we actually that's what we did at the family. We like to create books that are not only interesting but also just beautiful things. Um, so it's happening more and more and it's um, to connect with your, your talk, it's also a nice way to use the data that you gathered from years and years and years of work and maybe at some point you want to transform it into a more high level story and you can, the only way to do it is to do it in, through a book because a blog post you know, won't fit it um, and it won't have the impact that a book can still have today obviously. Uh, which is a good thing, I guess. There. Thank you. Uh, okay, let's assume I created a story. Uh, it's founding story or just data story, doesn't matter. What is success uh, in terms of covering media? For me, if I never did this, so I found one media that post having a post about me. What could be a success? Can I reach another 10 or can I reach another 15 or 100? Like what, what is, how, how to act in this way? I don't understand really how it works. Can someone help with this? Like you mean what success looks like? What would success looks like in terms of PR yeah, like successful coverage Cover by media. Yeah. What could um, be a successful coverage? So I guess it media? all goes down to the ROI of PR, uh, which is very taboo. <laughs> which is a topic that no one solved ever, and I think we won't solve it tonight. Um, because PR is not marketing, it's really hard to quantify the results of um, all the hard work that you put into PR. You have to accept the fact that you won't be able to just put um, a success rate you know, figure um, on, your, on your PR campaign. But that being said, um, I think ahead of any PR outreach, you can just ask yourself what I really want. Um, do I want to be published in a national? Because I, this is a kind of um, target that I, that I go to. Do I want to be published in some trade specialist media? Because I'm in a B2B startup and I really don't care about the mainstream. I don't care about the other people, I just want to reach out to these specific guys who are working in that specific industry. Um, so it's more 
qualitative, let's say, than quantitative. Um, and yeah, do you want to maybe add something to that? But it's, uh, yeah, as I said, it's a very complicated topic and every single founder is always requesting for, okay, what is the ROI of that if I go for a PR campaign? And no, that's not um, as simple as marketing, unfortunately, because you're not investing money. Just one small thing to add, maybe. Um, I think it's very important to think about it from a very in individual point of view. So before starting, you should really ask yourself, what is my niche, what is my sector? And if, it's, if you have a lifestyle brand, then you would just like, look for all the big lifestyle magazines or media outlets out there that you want to, to be published in. It doesn't need to be tomorrow, like PR can be a long-term game. But you can also just exchange with other companies within your sector, because I know that it can be very, very diff different from one sector to the other or from one type of media to the other. But you should definitely come up with a set of media outlets that you would want to be in in the end and then really observe it and and come up with first targets after some time and then you can adjust it but you can't really generalize it i think you really need to think about it from an individual point of view okay maybe one more um i have a question about the role of video in all of this and i wanted to ask amy do you care does it help for you uh, when you're looking for a story if, if uh, startups have some sort of video communication and also a question to more like what sort of video or startup and small budget would uh, you say should look at um personally this is a very personal thing i just i don't really consume anything through video partly because it takes data it sometimes involves sound and I don't have headphones like it's just not it's I don't find it a very practical thing that said um, you obviously can you know getting a sense like an interview of someone on a video or or sometimes for a very practical point of view like to understand um, like the onboarding process for a platform or like how something actually works that can be very useful so sometimes when companies have things like that like I'll use that as part of my research into the company but that's really the only the, that's the main example I can think of when I, I see something like that um, in terms of us producing content video is just really hard it takes a lot of time it's very expensive um, and I'm just Again, I'm just not sure it's like a super easy way for people to consume things. Podcasts, I think, is very different um, because you can like listen to it while you're walking and all that kind of stuff. Um, so it's not it's not really like a big big thing for me. And we did we did try it out in the super early days, and it was just like until you've got a big team as as a media producer, like that's not a good way to spend your time and resource. Um, so if I Take the family example. Actually, we do publish um, videos on YouTube, but it's because we want to have this educational goal. Um, and that's why, for example, we would put this talk on YouTube, um, just so that you know we can spread the world and um, make all the content that we produce available for anyone. Now, um, that being said, for the startups of our portfolio, we don't necessarily recommend them to to video because just like Amy said, that's um, a lot of money. That's a lot of time. Um, and I think maybe the only only um, case in which it can be interesting is um, for the startups that are only doing R&D, research and development. And sometimes it's really tough to really figure out, okay, what is exactly this startup doing? How how it looks because they don't have any product to show anything. And um, sometimes it can make sense to just show, for example, a lab, how it works, how the people in the team work, and maybe, yeah, put it in the video can be, can be interesting. But other than that, not really. Okay, beautiful. Oh, okay, let's do that one. So just to regard to the previous question, both uh, general. So who is the audience like uh, in this uh, media changing landscape uh, and regard to, to it's, it's not video. So how you can describe your audience, the, the, the people who are interested in startup uh, today? So, so who's Sifted's audience? So we see um, 
kind of like several categories. So a big primary one is obviously startups, people who work at startups and investors. So like the very core people in this landscape. And we don't think that um, there's, a, there's a media voice in Europe focusing specifically on Europe and not just always being like, Europe is not quite Silicon Valley. Like, that's a shame. Um, like looking at the real dynamics of this of this like uh, ecosystem. Then on a kind of like second level, you also have uh, governments, uh, public bodies, which are increasingly interested in innovation. Corporates, they've all got an innovation department in a WeWork somewhere. Like they're interested in what the kind of like startups are up to in their industry. Um, also universities, heaps of innovation coming out of them. And then we have another category, which we call the generally interested, which is anyone who's got an N26 bank account or a Monzo bank account and is like, ooh, what's this funky new thing? Or anyone who's used a scooter like anywhere in Europe and it's like, why are there suddenly so many scooters everywhere? What's going to happen? A, a car's dead? Is everything now scooters? Like, so actually, the scooter and the bank example are our most read stories on Sifted because people are Googling digital banks and scooters and they're finding us, like they're finding those stories organically. So I think there's actually a very big readership there as well of just people who are like, what's this? What's coming? You know, startups are creating the kind of the big companies of the future and the new products of the future and we want to be talking about them really early. Okay, cool. Thanks a lot, guys, for all the beautiful questions. Thanks a lot for the talks. Thank you.